morning. Uh, this morning's reading is from Matthew 4, verses 12 to 23. Just give you a moment to try to find it if you want to find it in your Bibles. And whilst you're doing that, have a think to the emotion that you felt when you changed the job. When you got married, like this couple are probably going to take that leap very soon. What was that emotion when you suddenly had to do something different? That's the emotion to have inside you when we're going to read this. Here we go. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadows of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. Now this is where the emotion comes. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left their boats and followed and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, AJ. I think that emotion actually applies wider than just that little bit that you called it, but it's for the whole passage, as I hope you'll see as we seek to unpack it, because that is uh, something of what you, you might be experiencing by the end of this, I hope so. Because <laughs> This is monumental stuff, yet I'm not sure we get our heads around it. Do you find it hard to take in things sometimes? Do you find it hard to get your head around things? To uh, acknowledge them, to understand them, to comprehend them? I don't know whether you saw uh, interviews with Emma with Radicano, get the name right, this week. She was still, even though she watched herself winning that match uh, last weekend, she watched back the, the replay, she still couldn't believe it was her who was actually playing the points she was watching it, she said in an interview in the middle of the week. Something she was really involved in at the heart of her life, and yet the reality is still not quite able to take it in, in her mind. Or maybe taking in something glorious and beautiful in God's creation, um, some years ago we had the, the joy and freedom of, of going to South Africa for a few weeks and um, we're driving on the garden route at the bottom of South Africa um, if you ever get a chance, glorious place. There's places called Paradise and Narnia and Eden there and with good reason because they are like that. Um, they are those sort of places. I, I, I remember one time driving around the corner and suddenly this vast vista, this glorious mountains and landscape and sea just open before us and it was like mind-blowing it was like i couldn't get my mind around it. it was something almost too big to grasp something beyond comprehension getting my mind blown by it or maybe one of the things we've certainly struggled with is monumental change maybe due to covid and things that have changed this last year and that's where AJ took us with the, the, the emotion of change, of things changing dramatically. What is it you find it hard to get your head around? Important things to recognise and understand. But I think a particular issue for us as Christians is that we don't really get our heads around or understand the Kingdom of God. We don't recognise what this is about. 
what the kingdom means in its fullness, in its entirety. There is a glorious truth here in the kingdom of God that actually, literally changes everything. This is monumental and it is at the heart of our faith. Some of you have been Christians many years, some years, I can't say too many years, can I? That gets, gets on the scale, gets on the nice, but a little while. Would you have all said the kingdom of God's at the heart of your understanding of faith and what it's about? I certainly have been a Christian for many years before that became true. I, obviously, there are things right at the heart of our faith, like the cross on which Jesus died, and understanding that and recognising that he died for us and that we need to be forgiven. But I hadn't really recognised this stuff about the kingdom of God. I hadn't got my mind around it. Maybe it was too big, maybe it was just too obscure. What, what does it mean? What's Jesus all about? Let's ask the Lord to show us now. Let's open and ask him to open our minds. You may have noticed I didn't pray at the beginning like I normally do. But I thought I, I wanted us to actually ask that he blow our minds that he open our minds to the wonder, to the vastness of his kingdom and all that it means. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know you are king. Your word proclaims it very clearly. We, we understand that as part of the Christmas story, that you are king. And you are the king of our world. You bring in the kingdom of God. Yet, Lord, we're not really comprehending fully what that means, what that involves, what this kingdom looks like, how we might engage with it. Open our minds now to the vastness of your kingdom. May our minds be blown by the wonder of your kingdom. May we embrace your kingdom more fully. For you are our king. Help us see. Open our minds, our ears, our hearts all that you'd say to us about your kingdom, O oh Lord, for your sake. Amen. And so today, we, in part two of this series on the kingdom of God, introducing the kingdom of God in the New Testament. Last week, Gareth started in the Old Testament and began to introduce us to this theme, because it's not just a theme that appears in the New Testament, it's a theme that is throughout the Bible, that God is king, and that his kingdom is coming. And we look today at how the kingdom of God is right at the heart of Jesus' ministry. And therefore it's something we do need to understand and, and have our minds open to, our minds blown by even. For this is something that he brings in right at the beginning of his ministry and actually is a theme that runs, as you'll see over the weeks and months ahead, throughout his ministry. So this is so important. We've, we've said that uh, our, the, the last part of our vision statement, the vision that we talked about in the summer, the vision that we've adopted, that we've embraced, that we want to see God's kingdom, so that God's kingdom grows, is the last phrase of that vision. But what does that mean? What does that look like? So we're unpacking that through this autumn, and the whole series uh, of sermons on the kingdom of God. Uh, hopefully we're going to be recording them. I hope I'm going uh, into a, a recording can at the moment. I get thumbs up from Andrew at the back. So all these sermons will be, you better watch uh, on our website. And uh, uh, will you load them up week by week? Because when you can, and something like that, Andrew will put them there. And you'll be able to reflect back and look over. Or if you miss one, you'll be able to catch up. Because it's so important that we gather, uh, and grasp the whole of this, uh, I believe, and understand this in its entirety and see all the facets of this glorious thing that is this kingdom of God. That, for Jesus, is right at the heart of his ministry. So let's see. That, that that's the case, uh, and begin to look at this reading in Matthew 4 that AJ read for us and helped us to connect with emotionally and uh, maybe begin to be challenged by the fact that change is involved in recognising and grasping the kingdom of God. This is right at the beginning. Jesus has been baptised by John, and he's been in the desert and tempted by the devil. He, he, he now uh, returns to, to Galilee and he hears that John, his cousin, has been put in prison. And it's like a, a green light for Jesus. Now's the start. Now's the time to do things. First of all, he moves to the heart of the area. He moves to Capernaum, moves from Nazareth. Uh, there's a lovely little detail there. Uh, 
Matthew brings it in because he wants to recognise where that is and recognise that this is all part of God's scheme of things and plan of things. But it's good and important to remember that Jesus is an ordinary guy, an ordinary person like you and I. And he moved house. And he went through all the process, all the hassle of moving house. And, and some of you have, have moved or are moving and, and recognise some of that. Some, uh, it, it is a, a, an issue, it's a challenge, it's an emotional change, uh, like AJ was reminding us of. Moving. Because Jesus was an ordinary person. He was man as man is designed to be. He was fulfilling the design that God made for mankind, for us as a uh, people. He wasn't some alien God figure who just pops down and does a little God thing. He is very much one of us. And that's a vital truth to remember, to reflect on, to know. And so he's fulfilling here God's design for mankind, and particularly God's design for the man who would be king, who would transform, set free, redeem our world, bring in God's kingdom to our world. So there's a whole history of what that looks like and how God explains that in the Old Testament. Did Gareth give us all that last week? I haven't watched his, his sermon back in detail. Uh, but we only gave him one, one sermon and one short passage in Isaiah 11. But I'm sure he began to grasp something of the, of the picture there. And interestingly, Matthew here quotes this passage from Isaiah 9. Gareth preached about Isaiah 11, two little bits in, in the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament that are in the middle of a passage that's all about God's new king and how God would send this king that would transform the world and who that king would be and what it would be like and how he would, uh, in the bit here that Matthew quotes, bring the people out of darkness into light. Interesting that the children and young people downstairs are doing the light of the world and we're thinking about Jesus. Bringing light. His kingdom is light. Transforming it into good ways. Darkness. And that's what this prophecy talks about here. And this is part of that prophecy, as I said, about the king that would come. He is man as man is designed to be fulfilling God's calling to be the chosen king. Who will set not just himself free or those around him free, but transform the world. This is life-changing, world-changing. So, that is the context, that's the setting. How does Jesus start? What does he say? What do you expect him to say? What might he say? What do you think he would say? Verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent, for the kingdom of he heaven is near or is arriving, is maybe a better way of translating it. It's happening, it's just about, it's not just near park over there, it's actually coming at you, as it were. Uh, it is arriving in this place. Because God's rule is coming, there's a need for repentance. What does that mean? The Greek word metanoia literally means between minds. Meta, between, noia, mind. You need to change your mind about things. Not just about, yes, about having done wrong things and needing to be sorry before God, and we are that, and we've had a prayer of repentance this morning. Yes, that is an important part of it. And we need that, that heart that recognises that we don't deserve God's goodness, and that we do need to say, sorry, Lord, have mercy, Lord. But the changing of the mind is bigger than that. This is actually changing everything about the way we think, but if we're immersed in the world's way of thinking, then actually this means a different mindset, a different way of thinking. It means a lot more. It does mean being sorry and repenting in that way, but it does mean a lot more than that, and having your mind blown and changed and transformed. Jesus says that we're to do that. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is arriving, is about to come, is about to hit you. Now, I'm a saddo, and um, I like steam trains. And so this weekend, it's a steam gala on the Seven Valley Railway. Now, I'm, I'm here at the tweet side, a meeting yesterday, can't go. So being the saddo that I am, I've been watching it live on the live channels on, on YouTube. So I've been 
getting the right time. You can watch these steam chains chug, chug, chug into different stations, Beaudley and, and Bridge North and Kidderminster. They've got cameras all over the Seven Valley, so there's lots to watch if you'd like to feel interested. No, you're obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> it gave me the idea for this next important illustration. So get the picture, even if you don't get steam trains. Maybe you think, I'll, I'll give you a different picture if, if that works better for you in a moment. But. So here I am, um, just enjoying life, sitting on the edge of what happens to be a, a railway track. And I'm just sitting here, and um, life's good, and things are good. Oops, better, better get there so those online can see me. And it's Jesus is saying, there's a steam train coming steaming at me down here, down this track, that's about to hit me. Uh, am I going to sit here and let it hit me? Or am I going to do something about it? Am I going to change? Am I going to change my mind about the way things are and get out of the way? Uh, and step away from that train, let it come on, and jump on board and be part of it. That's the drama of what Jesus says in the kingdom of God is coming here. The kingdom of God is coming. That's what he's talking about. This thing is, is, is world changing. And it can and will change your world. But you need to get on board. You need to change your mind of thinking about it. Repent of, of, of the stuff you, you, you got wrong about the way the world was. And jump on board with God's rule, God's kingdom, God's way. That's the challenge. Now, if steam trains aren't your thing, I, I, it was Isaac that gave a lovely little illustration when he drove his little lorry across the front here. So if a lorry is more your thing and you're sitting there in the road, watch out for the lorry coming like the kingdom of God. And if Isaac does it again, it will help you with the illustration. It's just, he literally drove his little lorry right across the front, just at the beginning of the service. Whatever it, illustration works for you, get the picture. This thing is arriving. God's kingdom, God's rule is arriving. That's what Jesus is saying here. And that's the beginning. It's the beginning of his ministry. It's the beginning of him showing it, demonstrating it. But it's also the beginning of everybody else, as we shall see, being involved in welcoming in that kingdom. That's why, as we prayed this morning, Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come. Because we're part of inviting this thing to happen. Welcoming this train coming down the track, or lorry, or whatever it is. This thing that's arriving imminently. And uh, we need to react, respond. There is an action to... to do at this point to repent, to change your mind about how things are, and welcome this train as it comes. Now, is anyone sharp among you and notice something I've got wrong or doesn't quite fit or isn't quite right? Nobody knows. We've even got a theologian here training for the ministry. He hasn't got it. <laughs> he hasn't got it. We've got another one training for leadership. They haven't got it. Has anyone, anyone seen it? Anyone brighter than them at the back there who's understood what the problem is about my preaching this morning and what's wrong with it? What are we talking about? We're talking about welcoming the kingdom of God. What does verse 17 say? What does verse 17 say? Somebody shout out. Okay. Yeah, repent for... For the kingdom of heaven is near. Heaven. doesn't say God. He says heaven, doesn't he? Matthew, in Jesus', Jesus words in Matthew here, kingdom of heaven is arriving. What's the difference? Now, an important little detail, but important little detail to see for an important reason. Matthew always puts kingdom of heaven. Same passages in the other Gospels, yeah, and you can look at them in parallel, he talk, talks about the kingdom of God. Why does Matthew use the word heaven there? Matthew was aiming to reach a certain group of people. He wanted to make sure there was no barriers in them understanding, getting the message, getting their minds blown by this, getting a hold of it. And he was speaking to the Jews, basically people of Jewish background. Hence, quotes like that passage from Isaiah, which fit in with Jewish history and the Jewish background, that show that Jesus fulfilled all that God said in the Old Testament to the Jewish people. But also, he was careful to use language that they would understand. Now, the name God was so holy they couldn't say it. We sang that lovely song Yahweh earlier, didn't we? Breathing Yahweh in. Yahweh is a, 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 a way of trying to say the name of God in the Old Testament. The problem is we don't know whether that's right or not. Because 
the, the Old Testament of Hebrew is only written in consonants. There aren't the vowels. You have to add the vowels later. And nobody ever said, no Jews ever said the name of God. He's so holy, so great, so glorious, that you never said that word. When they, you came to those letters, you would read instead the word Lord. You would not say. So if you look at your Old Testament, sometimes if you find the word Lord, sometimes it's in capitals, that's when it's Yahweh. Sometimes it's in lowercase, that's when it's just the word Lord, for Lord, the normal word for Lord. God was so special, you couldn't say his name. You couldn't actually talk about him uh, in addressing his name, saying his name. So we don't know how to say it. So Matthew, trying to reach that group of people, decides that the right way to describe this kingdom is the kingdom of heaven, not to use God's name, God, the type of God, in that way. Because God is so special and holy to the Jews. He didn't want to put anything in their way that would stop them getting it, understanding this, hearing the message. So he talks about the kingdom of heaven. But as you've already seen this morning, it prayed with us, if you pray together the Lord's Prayer, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom of heaven. He is in charge, he is the king of heaven. We want that rule on earth. So kingdom of heaven does mean kingdom of God. It's just a different way of saying it for an appropriate audience. Think about who you're talking to when you're talking about these things. And I'm encouraging you least to be talking about these things. Think about language that will work for people, that will communicate who our God is and how his rule can change their lives for the better. So it's not the lobby, it's the lunchbox. So if you ever get any late to the station, I don't quite know where that fits in, but there you go. <laughs> so this kingdom is arriving, it's coming. And what, what are we going to do about that? What's going to happen? How, how is there going to be a response to that? How is there going to be a, 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 a receiving of that message? This is what Jesus says. This is, it says... From that time on, Jesus began to preach. He went on preaching this for three years. This is the heart of his message, of what he said. It needs to be welcomed, but it also, interestingly, needs, is demonstrated by Jesus. He doesn't just say empty words. We get lots of people in our society saying empty words, don't we? Uh, uh, and different words and contrary words. But words that are powerful are words that have content, that mean something, that are true and work out in reality. So if Jesus says this thing is coming, react, response, you know, the steam train's coming down, you do something about it. The powerful thing is that he then demonstrates this and calls for that response and people make that response. So let's look at those two ways in which he demonstrates it in the rest of this passage. First of all, the calling of the disciples. The kingdom needs, needs citizens, the people who make him king. And he calls certain key people here to make him king. To go about that wrenching emotional change, as AJ pointed out to us, of literally changing their lives. For them, it, this did change everything. Think about these guys, um, James and John, who we talked about here in, in verses 21 and onwards. They were the sons of Zebedee. This was Zebedee and Co., fishermen. Uh, probably, maybe, maybe it wasn't Zebedee and sons. It was, it was his father's name. Because these guys have been fishing on that lake for generations. You know, it's one of those ancient established companies. They established in 1892. You know, when you see that on a thing, you trust that company because they've been around a long time. They're probably all right. Zebedee and Sons was probably like that, a fishing company. This is the end of it. Because here are the heirs, here are the sons who should be taking on the business and be part of it. Dropping everything, leaving, in Mark's Gospel, it says they leave Zebedee and the hired man. Leaving everything, leaving them, running a business, and they go to this Jesus. What have they seen of this Jesus? They might have seen at the baptism. They've heard him say, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is coming. The next thing they hear is, Follow me. Come follow me. What do they do? Somehow they see it. They get it. Maybe in a way we don't. They recognize the train is coming. They need to get on board. And they go with it. And they leave everything. They leave that family heritage, that business, the, 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 all that they're with. And they go with this strange new itinerant creature who's just appeared. And they follow him. And their lives are changed forever. Verse 22, immediately they left their boats and their father and followed him. 
The king calls for followers, and it will change lives. It will transform your life. If you hear Jesus say, come follow me, which is part of what this is about, the kingdom of life, and he's saying, come with me, the king. Come follow me. I'm the, I'm the one who's going to be the king that God has designed to transform not just this nation, but this world. Are you going to jump on board? Are you going to be uh, a follower of the king in that way? There's also an invitation, not just to be part of the kingdom, but also to be those who ask others to follow as well. Because in verse 19 he says, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Using their language again, language they understand, I'll make you people who help others to make the same decision, to come follow me, to jump on the train, to be part of the kingdom in the same way. So he said it, he asked people to make it to be true in their own lives, then he demonstrates it beautifully, powerfully. He shows that God's good rule is here now, setting the captives free. Verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching, the kingdom of God is here, repent, the kingdom of God of heaven is here, preaching that good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Healing every disease and <coughs> sickness among the people. Disease, disease, sickness, bad stuff that traps people, that hurts people, that limits people. Stuff that the good king the King of Kings wants to release people from, will release people from. He did, then, as he walked around this earth. It's filled out in a bit more detail. Verse 24, news about him spread all over Syria. People brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. The King sets the captives free. He did it. He didn't just say, his words aren't empty words, they were words full of power and authority. And people's lives are transformed for the better. And that's what this kingdom of God is about. It's not just words, it's about lives being changed for the better. He demonstrated it, and he taught his disciples to be part of it. Later he sent them out to do this stuff without him. And they became fishers of men, declaring the kingdom of God is near, is arriving. It's about to happen, toot toot, the, the, the whistle's being, being blown. Repent, respond, change your mind, change your thinking, change the way you see things and the way you work. This is the way God's kingdom comes. So what does it mean for you and for me, for us today? What does it look like to talk about repenting for the kingdom of heaven is arriving? Here, now, today. What do we need to do to welcome this kingdom? I pray that we would. I pray that our minds be open to it. I pray that you grasp, begin to grasp something more. But actually it's a lifelong journey of, of, of grasping the, the, the full breadth, width, entirety of what this kingdom looks like. Well, what does it mean? What do we actually have to do? What do we have to do, if you like, to go back to my sitting on the track analogy, to jump off the track and react? Well, first of all, you need to hear the message. You need to recognise it's true. You need to recognise that Jesus is the King and follow Him. <coughs> we all need to do that. And there's a place, and many will be able to remember a particular time and place, others, a period of time, when they changed their allegiance, when they recognised, when they did come follow Jesus. When they said, Lord, I'm sorry, if I have done wrong, I've got it wrong, my mind is wrong, forgive me please, for the stuff I've wrecked and wronged. Change me, Lord. Help me to be different, help me to be changed. And because he died for us on the cross, and brought in, proved this all to be true, that his kingdom is here, he can do that. He can forgive us, he can set us free from the stuff that has bound us in the past. Some of that working out may take time, but he can and does do that. So everything changes. It's not just about being sorry for the past, it's actually letting him transform the way we are, 
so the future is different. So that's the first thing that all of us need to do. At some stage we need to hear that call. We need to let him change our life. And we need to go on asking him to do that. To changing us. To, to becoming more the people he called us to be. More like him uh, as the Bible teaches us to aspire to. So if that's something you haven't yet done or that, that maybe you slip back from or you don't believe it's like you, you do wrong and you go around again and again. But the point is, we, with his help, it shouldn't be the same again. We shouldn't be repeating ourselves. Yes, we struggle and some of us do go on repeating the mistakes as it were. But with God's help, it can be different. We need to be praying and asking for that to happen and seeking for that difference in our lives, for that transformation, because that's what this is about, about the captives being set free. Even of a, 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 a habitual problem, a lifelong addiction, the king can set free. And then, once we do follow the king, once we do repent in this way, as the disciples did here, we become part of the team. Come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. We become those who declare the kingdom, who are to be saying this and demonstrating this to others. So our lives need to look like they are being changed by this king, but also we need to be learning how to pray for people and see things like described here, signs and wonders, like are described here, that demonstrate this kingdom. The, the, the healing of the sick, the disease is gone, those suffering severe pain being set free, the demon possessed being released, those with seizures, the paralyzed, all of this changed. And it can, and it will be, and it is possible that that happens. I have seen it, I've begun to see it in places that like some of us have got some stories to tell about the way God has miraculously healed. It's not complete, we've not got the whole story yet, we are at the final goal, and there is a struggle with why, why does this person get healed, not that one. All of that comes in this series, there's a whole sermon on the now and the not yet of the kingdom. Why, why don't we see it all now? Why do we have to wait for the completion of it? You'll have to wait till November till you <laughs> hear the answer to that question. We're going to try and look at these things and realistically struggle with them and look at them. But the important thing is that first we recognise this is or we begun to have our mind open to this wonder and say, yes, I want that. I want to recognise that. I want to understand that. And I want to let my God change me, but also change the world because of this. For his kingdom to come and change the situations that are around me. But we do need to talk away, as I was suggesting there. I remember one time we were praying for a guy who, I can't remember the whole story, but somehow he damaged his shoulder. I think it was a, an accident or something. Anyway, his shoulder was like sort of folded down. And we were praying for him at this healing conference. We'd learned how to pray. We were praying for him. As we were praying, literally over a few minutes, we saw, you could see the shoulder moving back to a more normal position from this bent forward position. Literally, it was in front of our eyes. Beautiful miracle to watch. But, about halfway back to normal, suddenly so stopped. We continued praying, nothing happened. So we asked him, what's going on? He said, I've been off work for, I can't remember what it was, some three, four, five years. If this goes back to normal, I'll have to go back to work. I'm not sure I want that. It would have changed everything for him if he'd been completely healed. He, he'd come to a point in life that he was happy with where he was. And he didn't want the transformation that God literally was offering. Offering him in front of us. There were choices to be made. There are, there's an offer that God is making. And uh, we are part of receiving this and letting that happen. And declaring it to others and seeing others. Set free. Because that's what it's about. As Jesus proclaims elsewhere, uh, like in Luke 4, he came to set the captives free. That's what the kingdom does. It sets the captives free. It brings light into darkness. We use another picture that's local, local because of our city motto. Light coming out of darkness. This is for us. Will we embrace it? Will we ask him to show us more of it? Will we have our minds open to it? Will we believe that everything 
can change for the better as the King comes and brings in this full picture, this kingdom for us. That's the challenge. That's uh, where these ideas of the kingdom bring us. So I want us to reflect on those and make appropriate responses and think about the kingdom and his bringing in the kingdom. Can I suggest you stand and ask to say a prayer and we will fairly shortly move into our next song um, and so the guys can get ready for that. As part of our response and our welcoming, the key. Um, I almost need a train whistle to go now, don't I? Maybe I should get off the YouTube and see if there's a steam engine somewhere tooting. Um, my wife's been annoyed over the weekend. She said, oh, he's listening to trains again because you can hear the toots coming out of the, <laughs> the iPad. The, the train is coming. <laughs> the kingdom is coming. It has been coming since Jesus declared it there and showed it, and it has over church history. And I'm sure at different times, in different ways, many of you could testify to ways God has changed things for the better, has brought in his good kingdom. Let's ask for more. Uh, uh, respond for the first time if necessary, but ask for more of this truth to be revealed to us, grasped by us, embraced by us, and then acted upon as we seek to learn about the kingdom over these next weeks and months particularly. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the king and that your kingdom is coming. Thank you for this powerful message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is arriving here and now. May we be ready to repent, to have our minds changed, to say sorry, Lord, for the times we've missed it, got it wrong, hurt you, hurt others, just not grasp what is possible, not believe that you can change those things in us that don't seem to be changeable. Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us. We want to welcome you, the King. Come now to us now by your Spirit and come and bring your kingdom into our lives. Arrive and transform and change. Show us areas you want to touch and change and transform. And show us how as we seek that transformation. For you to be king set us free and help us to be bold to help others find this freedom too, to say that you're king in ways they understand and to demonstrate that kingdom such that others too say, Jesus, be my king, I follow you. Like these guys amazingly did, giving up everything, giving up their heritage <coughs> because you are becoming king. We welcome you.